right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. And we're going to be talking today about the Constitution. And this event is hosted by the Division of Legal Studies. And we have our beautiful chairperson, Saini Taveras. She's here with us today. And she's going to introduce our amazing speakers today, Saini. And you're muted. Hi, Dennis. Thank go. you so much for introducing us, the division. And I want to thank the students and faculty joining us today. Um, but I want to highlight that we have Christian Perioni, who's very helpful always in uh, writing these invitations. I have who else from our uh, here at the college? Uh, we have one of our directors, Tatiana Kriskanova. Thank you for joining us um, and many others. Today, um, as uh, Dennis said, we are actually celebrating the drafting of the United States Constitution. And we have a treat with two of our very best uh, professors who teach for both the Legal Studies Division, um, for the Legal Studies Division, I'm sorry, but also for the Paralegal Program and the Criminal Justice Program as both are attorneys. Um, but before I get into their presentation, I wanted to lay out the foundation of why we're here today. I wanna thank our provost, Shanti Concord and President Valencia for allowing us to celebrate, um, celebrate today. I'm sorry, something popped up and I had to respond. So it's exciting to me as I am an admirer um, of the Constitution, understanding that we've had different periods and understanding that uh, some of us believe that the Constitution has to evolve. Um, with that being said, in 2004, Congress passed legislation establishing Constitution and Citizenship Day, a federal holiday com commemorating the ratification of the US Constitution on September 17. 1787. Um, this actually marks the 242nd anniversary of the historic event. Um, I wanted to just say that for 234 years, America, uh, America's constitution has guided our growth, shaped our progress, and defined us as a nation of sacred laws and fundamental values that so many other nations look up to us. Um, when our democracy is tested, we draw strength, strength from the Constitution to see us through. And I know that uh, Professor, uh, Professor Moreno and Professor Rivers will get into some of these, um, uh, some of these uh, laws that pertain and, uh, to the Constitution. So when our democracy is tested, as I said, we draw strength from the Constitution to see us through. And when we look ahead in our uniquely American way, restless, bold, and optimistic, our constitution is the bedrock we built upon to make a nation more equal, more just, and more prosperous to all the people. So what does America democ democracy requires? I mean, it requires a constant care, diligence, and a full participation to determine the course of conscience of our union. And so, you know, we have to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. And with that, I think the framers of the Constitution understood the extraordinary promise of democracy and in the, in the system of our government. So excited to introduce our two professors that will dive into all of these concepts that I just mentioned. Um, and let me just say a few words. I am proud to say that when I came in, I brought in these two professors and all, both have vast experience in the legal field. And I'm going to start with Professor Moreno, who is a graduate of CUNY Law School at Queens College. And there he obtained his Juris Doctor degree in 1990. And as you know, he recently uh, led a, a lecture on free speech. Um, he graduated from City College of New York, where he uh, obtained his bachelor degree in pre-law, magna cum laude, in 87. 
He's practiced for almost 35 years, 25 years, and has dealt with a uh, many cases, human rights cases in England, France, Italy, Germany, Europe, and just to name a few countries. And last but not least, uh, Professor Rivers, um, who graduated from the University of Arizona. There he obtained a Bachelor of Arts majoring in political science and communication. And uh, he graduated here from uh, New York Law School. He obtained his Juris Doctor degree, cum laude, in 1992 and was an assistant district attorney in Queens, New York, and deputy district attorney in Santa Cruz, San Bernardino County, California. I'm sure some of you have heard him talk about this um, and, and highlight cases in some of the uh, classes that he teaches. Then he went on to practice primarily white collar criminal defense attorney, but also handled matters dealing with civil rights, Herbie's corpus, family law, contracts, and, and more. Um, and he's handled cases across the U.S., Denmark, Greece, and the Netherlands. So you have vast experience. And with that, I leave you with uh, Professor Rivers and Professor Moreno. Take it on. And Thank again, you. welcome to all the students and prospective students. And remember, registration is on now for the fall semester. I'm going to leave you with my email and number in case you have any questions. And last but not least, they're going to present. And at the end, we're going to leave 10 minutes for questions. Thank you so much. Welcome, professors. Enjoy the conference. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, welcome, uh, everyone. We're honored that you are here with us today, giving up on the um, excitement of a New York City Friday afternoon uh, to, to spend some time with us to um, celebrate uh, Constitution Day. Um, this is very important. Our Constitution is uh, 234 years old uh, today. Um, and of course, it, it's vital that we um, keep our the importance of our Constitution present. The rights that we hold dear, the presumption of innocence, the right to a jury trial, uh, the right to counsel, uh, you know, free speech, all of those rights which we which make America um, what it is, were enshrined in our Constitution uh, by men like Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton. And I think it's fitting that we spend some time talking about them um, and what they meant. This is particularly uh, relevant uh, given the situation uh, that we live in in our country today, given the recent experience of January 6th. Um, now, we're not saying that we support everything this man believed in and, and did. Uh, and in fact, we're prepared to be very critical about them and quite frankly, say some pretty nasty things about them when the time comes. Uh, but I think it's critical that we keep something in mind. These men had something to teach us. And it's in our interest uh, to make sure that we follow uh, their advice, that we, the lessons that they um, taught us, that we apply them to the crisis, the situation that we're going through in America today, that have been going through um, in America. And so, um, what Professor Rivers and I are um, going to do, it's basically to have a conversation with you uh, in the hope that this conversation will then extend itself uh, to um, your respective circles, family, places of work, uh, because American democracy, and I don't think I'm being an alarmist when I say this, uh, it's at risk. Uh, we saw a sample of that on January 6th, um, and it's not over. It's still, there are still challenges that we have to face. Um, if, if my recollection serves me, um, I believe that there is a demonstration tomorrow at the Capitol um, to commemorate or in support of the January 6th insurrection. Now, I do realize that people, you know, have different views about these things and that there may be some of you out there who might be sympathetic to um, the people who stormed the Capitol. I'm prepared to hear um, your questions on that issue. But the underlying uh, point is that 
um, the fact that the that January 6 happened and that there is going to be a supporting demonstration tomorrow, it's an indication that uh, American democracy it is at risk and it's important that we go back, look at the Constitution, look at our constitutional history, and see what we can learn from these brilliant minds who are not perfect in any way, as I said earlier, uh, but they did have something to teach us. Um, and, and I think it's in our interest to, um, to, to remember and pay attention uh, to their lessons. Um, now, um, Professor Rivers and I have diametrically opposed views on the American constitutional experience. In other words, we're both passionate students of the Constitution, but we don't quite see it the same way. Uh, Professor Rivers is more, it's partial to the views of John Adams, our second president, um, who was also um, a, a um, staunch Federalist. I'm more um, of an admirer, if I may use that term, of Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was um, an anti-Federalist, but also the man that, in my view, created or conceptualized the ideas of what we call America. Uh, the concept of Jeffersonian democracy that I keep talking about, it's essential to understand what the American constitutional tradition is all about. Um, and so keeping in mind that Adams and Jefferson and Madison and, and Washington, that all of these men were flawed in some way or another, uh, I think the essence is that they created something that First of all, when, when America was created, it was not a foregone conclusion. Um, a lot of most people didn't think it would last. There were analysts in uh, Europe who um, said, uh, you know, they gave us five, 10 years tops and they'll be begging the British to take them back. Well, that hasn't happened and it's been 234 years. So I think that these guys sort of knew what they were talking about. Now, I think that the one of the things to, that my, I think might be productive for us uh, in the course of this conversation is to go back to the text, uh, to go back to the text of the Constitution, look at what it means, what it said, uh, and how it's been interpreted. So the first important aspect I think we need to look at is the preamble. Uh, to the Constitution, the preamble of the con to the Constitution, which is basically the founding fathers. And I know Professor Rivers has an issue with my referring to them as the founding fathers as opposed to founders. Appa but, apparently, I, I have many issues, apparently. Uh, but that's one of them. Um, <laughs> and so, but so the founding fathers or the founders in Professor Rivers' term came up with a preamble. Notice how it begins. We, the people. Notice that it doesn't say we the elected official or we the government. And there, I think you see um, sort of the seed of Jeffersonian democracy, um, basically saying American democracy is going to be different. We the people is an indication that our democracy is going to be based on people's power. It's, it's going to be based on the idea that this democracy, as opposed to other governmental experiments you know, that existed then in Europe and other parts of the world, our America, it's going to be, and, and as far as I'm concerned, um, it's a good thing that it became and it remained Jeffersonian in essence. We the people means that. It means we believe that the real power, the, the true power, the essence of power in the American tradition rest with the people. Uh, hence the beginning of the preamble, we, uh, the people. And this guy, we're absolutely brilliant. Um, so here's what they did. It's a pretty short document. Um, so seven articles, it's pretty short, uh, 27 amendments. And in the seven articles, and I'm going to talk about three of them in a few minutes, uh, but essentially what they did here is create a government structure of government the and the process since the uh, creation since the ratification of the constitution we've had 27 amendments we should 
spend a couple of minutes talking about the first 10 of them, the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was not part of the original Constitution. And the reason why it was not part of the original Constitution is because the founding generations uh, of this country um, was not in agreement. Some of the founders were thought that it was a good idea. Jefferson certainly thought so. Um, some of the other founders were not so sure. Hamilton was particularly vocal about, um, you know, why do we need uh, a Bill of Rights? I mean, are, don't the states already have some sort of Bill of Rights? But the, the Jefferson insisted that it was important that if you are going to have a democratic government, you need to have a Bill of Rights. Now, uh, so those were the first 10 amendments. Um, I think the other uh, amendments I want to spend uh, a couple of minutes on is the Reconstruction Amendments, uh, which is the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, also known as the Civil War Amendments. And these were passed um, in the aftermath of the Civil War. You know, we, we fought a Civil War from 1861 to 1865 in America. Um, over the issue of, largely over the issue of slavery. Some people say it was not really about slavery, it was about states' rights, which Professor Rivers is going to have plenty to say in a few minutes. Um, but here is an interesting uh, thing about the Reconstruction Amendment and the 19th Amendment, if you look here on, on number three. Now, the 19th Amendment is when women got the vote in America. And this was in 1920. That's practically yesterday. So one of the interesting things about the American country, uh, constitutional tradition is that this is a contradictory, complex country. For example, if you look at the Reconstruction Amendment, the 15th Amendment gave African-American men the right to vote. So African-American men got the right to vote before white women got the right to vote. And this is something to, to think about. America is not a country that you can easily define. It's complex. It's complicated. Uh, and, and, and the founders, the people who put this thing together, um, this serves, I think, a great deal of credit um, because they made this possible and they remain relevant. Now, I mentioned that I was going to talk about three um, of, the, um, of, the, of the seven articles. And I think these three um, really show the genius of the founders. In, in, in the first three articles, they basically established the federal government. So the, um, and, and the order, by the way, uh, was not fortuitous. The order is important. Article one, of the Constitution establishes the legislative branch, the Congress. And there again um, is Jeff the Jeffersonian idea of we the people, because as far as Jefferson understood it, the true representative of the people is not the presidency, it's not the courts, it's the Congress. And therefore, it is fitting that the first article of the Constitution establishes the legislative branch, which is the true representative of the people. Um, and so it is important that we understand why it is first, just as it was important to understand why the preamble begins with we, the people, you see the threat. Um, then they moved on uh, to um, Article 2, and they created the executive branch. Uh, and uh, then Article 3 and created the Judiciary Branch. Um, when you look back at the creation of the federal government, there are several things at play here. And one of them is the genius of not concentrating power in one single branch. And again, this is something that uh, Professor Rivers is going to talk about, this notion of separation of power that John Adams kept talking about. Um, that it was critical that if we were going to have a viable democratic experiment, well, then you're going to have to have checks and balances. You can't have one branch controlling everything. And of course, it was central because he, he didn't trust people very much, uh, perhaps for, for good reason. Now, um, on the 
first um, amendment, or rather the first uh, article to the Constitution, Jeffersonian felt that it was important to actually have um, a narrow interpretation. That is the idea of limiting the government, limiting the, the powers of the federal government. And so that leads us to um, the essence of the American democratic experiment, which is, as I see it, Jeffersonian democracy. Now, what is Jeffersonian democracy all about? Well, of course, it was established by uh, Jefferson, who was our third president. And one of the things that Jefferson uh, said from the very beginning of the idea of the creation of the United States was to say, I want America to be a Republican government. And of course, he didn't mean the Republican Party. He was talking about republicanism as a form of government, as opposed to the monarchy that we had um, that, that existed at the time in England, that in fact still exists uh, in England. So he wanted an emphasis on this is a government of the people, not of the monarchy. So that's one of the distinguishing factor uh, in Jeffersonian democracy. There was an incredible emphasis placed on free speech. Jefferson was was he was it, his, his, his contribution on the area of free speech cannot be overstated. He said he insisted you cannot have a democratic society if you don't have free speech. And of course, the Federalists opposed him on this because they felt, well, you know, what's the big deal about free speech? You know, I don't think we need to bother with including that in the Constitution. But he insisted it stood its ground, and eventually, free speech made her into uh, the Bill of Rights. He was opposed to an aristocratic rule. In other words, this whole idea that the upper class should determine what happened in America. Um, now, Jefferson was, of course, a very complex individual because he owned slaves. And I'm pretty sure uh, Professor Rivers is going to have a thing or two to say about that. Me? Um, but, but here is the issue. What I'm saying, when I talk about Jefferson and how much I admire him, I'm not telling you that he's perfect. Of course he was not. He was flawed like everybody else is. But if you are going to take his negative points, his flaws, and you're going to diminish and dismiss everything that he did for this country, you would be doing his memory a disservice, but also the country a disservice. Because I think that the, the way that we can address some of the issues that we deal with today is by looking back. And Jefferson had plenty to say. On the issue of slavery, and you know, every time I talk about Jefferson, there's always somebody that comes up with, oh yeah, but he owned slaves. And, and you know, he had a relationship with this woman named Sally Hemmings. Um, I'd like you to read, there's a book uh, he wrote called Notes in the State of Virginia, which is not just about the state of Virginia, it's about America. And it, in that book, you will find what Jefferson believes about slavery, how he felt about blacks. And so it's not as simple as um, he owned slaves, therefore we don't need to listen to anything he said or did because he was a hypocrite. And we don't care that he wrote the Declaration of Independence and that he stated that all men are created equal because he's a, he's a hypocrite. Um, I obviously disagree. I think that this was a great man, as, as were all the founders, um, who were not perfect in any way. But this constitution that still stands today is a result of largely of his thinking. I'm not saying he did it all by himself. Uh, but the the leading intellectual figure, the, the the reason why Jefferson looms large in the American imagination is because at some level we understand he's the guy that put it together. All right. So um, what I'm going to do now is it's sort of provide a transition for Professor Rivers to um, unload on Jefferson <laughs> and other things. Um, and what you're looking at now is sort of a bird's eye view of the distinction between Federalist and Anti-Federalist, you know, where they disagreed. 
Um, and, and as I said, Jefferson, obviously, on the anti-federalist uh, side of the equation, um, you know, John Adams um, on the opposite side of the equation. And so, um, but I'll, I'll have Professor Rivers say um, more about that. And then we'll, we'll come back because we'll get into it. As I said in the beginning, we have major disagreement, uh, but let's see what you have to say. Well, thank you, Professor Moreno. That was spectacularly uh, uh, bent towards uh, Mr. Jefferson. And I'm happy to be here to talk about the other side of this equation, which is the point, which is the point. One of the points I want to make right up front is what makes a young boy immigrate to the United States from the Dominican Republic, pick himself up by his bootstraps, go to law school, become a successful lawyer, what makes him an American, and what makes a young boy from a uh, housing project that still stands in East New York on the corner of Ashford and Linden, what makes him American? How do these two guys from vastly different backgrounds with vastly different upbringings and different color skin and different color hair, if I might point that out, what makes us American is this document that we're talking about today. The notion that we believe, no matter what our religion, no matter what our background, no matter where we're from, in freedom and the rule of law. And Professor Moreno spoke about we the people, but the argument that we're talking about today is not that the power should be with the people, but who are the people, right? Who controls the strings? That is the argument, the ultimate argument between federalists and anti-federalists. Federalists, right, which on the one side was John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, who we've seen on Broadway, everybody seen, has seen on Broadway, and John Jay, another great, Ameri a great New Yorker, um, on the one side, and Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry on the other side, the federalists believing that this power, right, should be centralized in the strong, powerful federal government, as opposed to Jefferson and the anti-federalists who believes that this power, we the people, should be the people in Orem, Utah, in Los Angeles, California, in New York, New York, not some centralized area, all powerful, knowing federal government. So the idea is, who do we believe? Is it John Adams and Alexander Hamilton? Is it Thomas Jefferson and James Madison? Where do we go? Well, I think first we need to look, you've, you've heard about Thomas Jefferson. I think we need to look at the other side on, of the Federalist side and look at the folks that we're talking about, specifically John Adams. Okay, why, you know, John Adams is one of those people that kind of got forgotten. I mean, he's the second president of the United States, the first vice president of the United States. He was instrumental in the Declaration, of, in, in not only getting the Declaration of Independence written, but also actually declaring the de de uh, independence with Britain. He kind of got lost. He doesn't have a monument, right? Everybody else does, but there's no monument to John Adams at all. But why did he believe in a strong central government? Because there is, was at this time, in both their careers in the 1780s, 1770s and 1780s, Adams believed that if you, if a human being, a gentleman would walk into a candy store in 1776 or 1777, and there was nobody at the counter, that that human being might very well grab a candy bar, put it in his pocket, and walk out. Basically, the greed, we're greedy, we do the wrong thing. When we're, when we're left alone, we're going to do the wrong thing. Whereas Thomas Jefferson believed that that same person would walk into the candy store grab the candy and leave the quarter on the counter because that's the right thing to do. That is the fundamental difference between the Federalist side and John Adams and the Jefferson side and the Anti-Federalists. That John Adams believed we needed a strong central government to counteract our impulse, right? Our impulse is to kind of do the wrong thing. And if we dissipate power too much amongst the states, amongst the towns, amongst the cities, that things are going to go wrong because people are inherently kind of greedy and somewhat nasty. And I think, you know, which side of that argument you fall on, 
it's just going to depend what what you what you believe. I mean, ultimately, this notion of federalism, right? The power of the one over the power of the many. And if you look at the, this particular slide, you'll see the one star on the left, the power of that individual state or the individual city or the individual versus the power of all 50 as a group, right? This is the idea that we're talking about when we're talking about federalism and anti-federalist. So the federalists would be the ones on the right side of your screen with all the stars. The anti-federalists would be the one on the left side of the screen with only one. But a question arises for all of us. And one of the question is, okay, is this all about this lofty principles of the power of the one versus the power of the many? I mean, is, is that what we're talking about? Is this some philosophical argument? Or is there some practical stuff going on here? Is this about money? What is it about, this federalist versus anti-federalist? I mean, it's very lofty. It's something we talk about in academ academia. But the fact is, there was a lot of other issues on each side of this equation. Money was one of them. Was the power going to be centralized in the cities, this coming industrial revolution that the founders foresaw, right? This expanding government, was the power going to be sitting, the money going to be sitting in New York and Philadelphia? Or was the money and the power going to be sitting in the farms in Philadelphia and these places that are coming, South Dakota and at the time, Illinois? I mean, these are, it's the city versus the rural, the farmers, the, the farmers being the anti-federalists, the cities being the federalists, right? The moneyed interests being the federalists, those farmers that don't want to deal with banks, those are the anti-federalists. So these lofty ideals are also connected to practical use, right? How do we use this power? But there was a lot of animosity here. I mean, there was a lot of personal animosity, and I would step aside for a second and point out to you that there really were no good old days, okay? We hear it all the time on when you watch CNN, MSNBC, Fox, whoever you want to watch, they talk about, well, things have gotten bad. They're terrible now. Politics are, well, no. Um, at Thomas Jefferson once uh, anonymously wrote a letter to a, a newspaper saying that under another name saying that uh, John Adams was a hermaphrodite because they were political enemies at that time. And John Adams responded by saying Jefferson was dead. I mean, th this is the kind of, this has been going on forever. And which begs the question, was there any other arguments that these people had, right? These federalists and anti-federalists. And the answer is yes, many, one of the central, central um, issues at the time was on the one side, the Federalists saying, remember, we just fought a war against Great Britain. We were 13 colonies separated. Each state sent, uh, well, colonies at the time, sent troops and incurred debt, right? So each state, there were 13 piles of debt. Alexander Hamilton, being the brilliant person that he was, said, you know what? Let's not make it Virginia's debt, New York's debt. Let's make it a debt for the United States. That's called assumption. Mr. Jefferson and Mr. Madison vehemently opposed that the United States government would assume this debt. Why? Because once the United States assumed all this debt, power becomes centralized, right? They fought tooth and nail. Jefferson despised Hamilton, despised him, okay? Adams was kind of in the middle as far as the personalities go, but there was a big fight. And one of the fights that this got negotiated out with at a dinner in New York, in Manhattan, Thomas Jefferson was here, and so was Mr. Hamilton, and so was the capital of the United States. They had dinner with Mr. Madison at Mr. Jefferson's home, and what did they do? They negotiated and traded. The capital was moved to the south and this swamp called Washington, D.C., and it was not given statehood and it didn't belong to anybody. It was just this area, the District of Columbia. In exchange, Jefferson and Madison voted for assumption. So this permeates everything in our country, and later on we're going to talk about how we're going to bring it up today. This is today. This fight goes on today. The Civil War 
was about this was it about states rights well i don't know that's what the vacate was it that's what the south was saying it was about state rights states rights the north said it at the beginning too but it really was about other things as well slavery um we go through the depression coming up now into the 1900s <clears throat> FDR gets voted into office, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and what does he do? He becomes the ultimate federalist, grabbing as much power as he can. Why? Because we had a problem, a national problem. People weren't eating. There was no food. There was no money. Banks were going to fail. So he ran out and grabbed all this power, centralized it in Washington, D.C., and was fought tooth and nail by the United States Supreme Court, who were all, almost all of them, anti-federalists from the anti-federalist camp and believe that the states are the ones that need to deal with these problems, not the central government. This argument continues today when we talk about civil rights, women's rights. Shouldn't there be an, an amendment, a federal amendment, and the states say no? It should be from state to state to state. Why is the federal government getting involved in this idea? We get into also voting rights. Now here, this is brilliant, brilliant drafting, right? What do we do here? We have Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1, and how do they deal with this? They actually embed this anti-federalist and federalist fight into the Constitution and create this tension. Read it out loud. The Times places and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. Wow, anti-federalist right there, right? And then semicolon, but the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations. It's right here. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, you students that are going to make these changes and make a difference in our society it's happening this minute this clause is being debated in the public square right now with new voting regulations in georgia and texas the federal government your government your house of representatives is currently discussing this clause in how can we stop these states from doing what they're doing with the state saying, states' rights, leave us alone, right? So this is happening today at this moment. And Professor Moreno, I actually have a couple of questions for you that I would like to talk to you about. Is that okay with you? Uh, it's perfectly okay with me. Well, isn't this idea of states' rights and anti-federalism just code for racism and Jim Crow? especially as you brought up in light of the fact that Mr. Jefferson owned generations of slaves. I, I, I think there was a problem with the premise of the question. Now, again, as I said earlier, I'm not here to argue that uh, Jefferson was this perfect man, but I totally disagree with the assumption that somehow states' right was code language for Jim Crow. Now, what some people projected to the Jeffersonian idea of a state's right, he's not responsible for. Of course, the, you know, the Jim Crow South decimated the rights, uh, the, the few rights that African Americans had obtained. But I don't think it's, it's appropriate. I don't think it's fair. And history has been incredibly unfair to Jefferson to say, well, look, he was for states' rights, so therefore, I think it's a reductionist argument to say that because he was for states' rights, therefore, anybody who advocates state rights and in the process engages in racist, blatantly racist attitude, we can blame that on Jefferson. So I don't, I think that what happened, that Jefferson's idea was, I won the ultimate power to rest with the people. And he felt that the existence of a government, a federal government that could override, this is, is actually federal supremacy. This is what he was afraid of. And what he was saying was, he was not saying we 
reserve the right to discriminate against people on the basis of race. I would argue that Jefferson was not a racist. If you read his writing, it is clear that he was not. Did he have racist ideas? He probably did, but there is a difference between the two. Well, so, I think that you're, uh, you may be right on that, but actions, we would say, speak louder than words. But I do have another question for you, if I may. Go ahead. Just, I'll give you that one. We will, we, will, we will accede on that point and ask you this. Jefferson fancies himself always did as a strict constitutionalist, you know, states' rights, and we want to dissipate power. Yet here he comes along when he becomes the third president of the United States, significantly expands the power of the federal government. What does he do? He runs and buys Louisiana from the French. How do you square that circle? You're, you're absolutely right. And, and what it does is that it shows Jefferson as a person who said, look, before I became president, I thought this whole idea of American expansion was horrible. Now I became president and he saw things from a different perspective. And that's what a mature, intellectually mature person does. I think that the purchase of Louisiana was a good thing. Um, when he, before he became president, he, he would not agree. If let's say John Adams had suggested the purchase of Louisiana, I think Jefferson would have objected. The, the non-president Jefferson would have objected. But once he became president, he realized that this was in the United States' best interest. And so is that an example of hypocritical behavior on the part of Jefferson? I don't think so. I think it's an example of, you know, he evolved. He had certain ideas uh, pre-presidency, um, which he changed when he became president. That, there's Fair nothing enough. proper about that. Fair now, enough. If, if I, I do have to, because, you know, I'm sick and tired of people beating up on Jefferson, and he's a hypocritical guy, and he's, you know, he writes the Declaration of Independence, but then he turns around and he owns slaves. Let's talk about John Adams. Let's. Which you're, which, which you're you know, um, you keep talking about Adams and how, you know, how important he was. And I agree. Don't interpret my question to mean that I'm diminishing Adams' contribution. But Adams, this John Adams, the person who fought for American democracy, became president. What is the first thing he does? He says, oh, by the way, starting today, it shall be a crime to criticize the president. Is that not an example of hypocritical behavior on the part of John Adams? Is that not as hypocritical or more so than Jefferson's all men are created equal, but then own 500 slaves? Oh, here we go. It's the Alien and Seditions Act um, that we're bringing up for Mr. Adams. And the answer is, is it hypocritical? I don't know, but I will tell you that uh, if you read the letters that went back and forth from his most trusted advisor, Abigail Adams, his wife, and he, he knew several things that he knew. One of them was he was arrogant and ambitious, and his wonderful counselor always reminded him of that. But also remember, this was not – this Alien and Seditions Act didn't pop up out of nowhere. This Alien and Seditions Act came up because we were on the precipice of war as a young nation, the second president of the United States, about basically 10 years into the country, on the precipice of war with either France or England. And when he went to his best friend at the time, who was also Secretary of State, and said, Mr. Jefferson, I need you to go to France to talk to the French since you are their best friend. They're, they love you. Jefferson refused. And Adams was left kind of on his own in this particular path, and it was a problem. And he, he, this was his greatest regret was the Alien and Seditions Act. And, and I can't, there's nothing we can do to erase that, just as we can't erase Mr. Jefferson's ownership of slaves. One last I, question. I'm sorry. I think we should, I think maybe we should, we should wrap so we can open for, uh, questions what do you think i think i have uh, I uh, professor moreno has one more question for you professor rivers and then we'll wrap it up thank you okay. so much wow yes. this has been an ama amazing conference thank you thank you mr Veras. and i it's just one question 
Uh, Professor Rivers, how do you respond to people who say that Donald Trump had traces of John Adams? And he, but, but, but before you jump at me, but here is what they base it on. John Adams was a very thin-skinned person. The reason the Alien Sedition Act was passed had nothing to do with fear of counter-revolutionary movement in America. It has something to do with the fact that the guy couldn't stand people not loving him. He felt that everybody had to love them. And if it's not going to happen voluntarily, by God, I'm going to make it a crime for you to say bad things about me. I would, uh, again, argue with the premise of, the, of your question about what was going on at the time. However, I would submit to you, Professor Moreno, that if you show me a politician that doesn't want to be loved by his constituency, I will show you that person not to be a politician. And John Adams, in particular, was, by his own admission, thin-skinned. He was short, heavy, balding. Everybody out, George Washington, who preceded him, was six foot two and handsome. Thomas Jefferson was five foot eleven and great looking guy. And here was this little pudgy guy from Boston who, yes, believed everybody was talking behind his back. And I think, though, the last thing that I want to say is not about the fight, but about what these two agreed on, right? And they agreed to this. Not they all the founders agreed to one thing. Education is the key to keeping our democracy alive. We as citizens have an obligation to the nation and to each other to educate each other. And you, all of you, and those of you that have been in my classes know I've said this dozens of times. You are the key to realizing the promise that is in those documents, the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution, you are alive at a wonderful time and you are going to leave here, all of you, and make this promise of freedom and diversity and inclusion finally come to fruition. And I want to thank Professor Moreno, thank Ms. Tavares, the chair, and thank Dennis for allowing us to have this presentation. The same goes for me. I'm immensely grateful to Mr. Veras, to Dennis, for his help and patience with those of us who can't do technology if our life depended on it. Thank you. Go ahead. And if there are any questions, we're happy to address them. Why don't we begin so, with the first question, Dennis, that uh, Christian per Thank you so much. I'd like to say thank you to Professor Rivers and Professor Moran. It's been an amazing presentation. I love how you bounce off the different questions between each other. It was it was fantastic. All right, and we're gonna move on to the question and answer section. And I just started it. So we already have some questions in the chat that we're going to start um, showing on the screen. And for the rest of the folks that haven't had a chance to address their questions, it's the time. Please type them in, in, in the chat and we're going to start. Thank you. All right, so we had the first question. And that's the first one. Um, yes. Hi, Dennis. PhD dissertation, relations between church and state U.S. In this regard, I'm analyzing the Supreme Court's two approaches, one, separationist view, and two, accommodationist view. Is it possible to have some materials um, because they're in Turkey? Um, I guess we'll pass on the uh, email and professors can pass on those materials. Sure. We'll be glad. Um, thank you for your question, Mr. Juxel. Let's go to the next question. Sounds I will great. send that email to the professors. Yes. Thank you, Sandy. If it were just up to the Southern states instead of the federal government, do you think they would have done the right thing and ended slavery? This is one of our chairs, Mr. Piricani. Um, I think if I may go first, uh, Professor Rivers, um, I, I don't think they would have. Um, you have to understand that the, the South um, you know, the Southern states were slave society. And what that meant was that the essence, the economic uh, life of those states depended on slavery. 
So I don't think that they would have done it on their own. I mean, it's just why they fought a war over it. Uh, so my position is I don't think they would have. I would agree. I, and I think the way you would look at it, it it's all about money. Uh, Mississippi's Mississippi was the number two economy in this country when this country was formed. Uh, prior to the Civil War, it was number two behind Virginia. After the Civil War, it was last. It remains last. So I think the answer is no. I don't think they would have done the right thing. Next question. Um, same person, uh, our chair, Mr. Perry Connie. Are there any examples of states' rights being used to advance a liberal cause? Yeah, if, if I may jump in first, Professor Moreno, we'll just sure. alternate. Um, I would say abortion, you could see as something that was advanced by a state's rights. Certain states made uh, a woman's right to choose legal. New York, California, um, other uh, more quote unquote liberal states um, used the idea that the power was dissipated within their state to start a movement. Same sex marriage is another one, right? That the states individually started to act and it wasn't until later on that the federal government kind of through either through the courts or through legislation kind of went forward with it. I think uh, my uh, two cents on this is that uh, particularly since the beginning to middle of the 20th century, um, you began to see um, a change in terms of um, states' rights and, and, and legislation promoting liberal causes. And I think it required the intervention of the federal government, regrettably. And in fact, the Roe v. Wade decision was basically that with the state, Texas, uh, saying uh, to this woman, you can't have an abortion. And if you dare have it, we're going to prosecute you. We're going to criminally prosecute you. And the case had to go all the way to the Supreme Court uh, for Justice Blackman to say uh, that a woman had a right to choose. So I, I'm highly skeptical um, of um, states' rights advancing liberal causes. Now, this may sound contradictory uh, from a Jeffersonian, but, but if, if you think about it, it it's not. Because I think there is a difference between the Jeffersonian idea of a state rights and what states' rights are about today. Um, I don't think that if Jefferson were alive, and of course, it's a major speculation on my part, he would support uh, the you know interference with borders right in Georgia and Texas and other states. So I, I'm not uh, particularly optimistic that um, states will promote liberal causes. Thank you. Thank you. Next. What have states' rights been used to for besides oh, racism? It's a comment, I guess, but I guess your thoughts on that. Well, I would say, I would, I would argue, and this is where this whole federalism thing comes through to today, this idea of elections and what happened on January 6th is the, those folks that believe in this conspiracy nonsense and bringing down the government are hiding behind this veil of states' rights and that the federal government is too strong and that the federal government is, is uh, basically Satanistic and out to hurt us. Um, that's where I think Professor Moreno and I agree that this state's rights idea has been perverted. And now it's turning into, uh, it's being used as a cudgel or a spear to destroy the nation. I totally agree, absolutely agree. I would add that um, there's, there's, you have to keep in mind the chronology. There was a time uh, in American history when states' rights did promote positive things. Um, a lot of people don't know, for example, that the state of Massachusetts abolished slavery long before the federal statute, long before the, the 13th Amendment was passed. That was the state's right initiative. But we're talking about, you know, the late or rather early um, 17th century. Um, I think that state's right uh, from the second half of the 20th century till today, it's all bad news from as far as I, as I can see it. How many more? Wow. We um, have a couple more. 
This is so we have we're gonna go quickly because it's almost three and we do we'll give it a few more minutes but we have uh, something more to do and so we have to end this no later than three or five so let's keep it short the answers my question concerns civil disobedience in the context of current events propaganda about covid virus vaccines to which citizens are forced against their beliefs should the institution of civil disobedience apply are we currently already dealing with it through protests, class action lawsuits, other demonstration? And does this make sense to promote ideas? And can it succeed in defending our rights? So that's like a three, two part question. If we feel that our rights are violated, the right constitution, I guess the an example of that, of, I guess freedom of speech is what they're trying to say to decide about ourselves. Is it worth defending them through strikes, protests, or similar form, similar forms, is it our duty? Um, if I may, um, I think my take on this is that when it comes to issues of civil disobedience, particularly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, there is uh, a balancing act that needs to be gotten into, and that is your individual rights uh, versus public safety. And of course, this is not new. When chickenpox uh, came around and, and there was a vaccine developed uh, in the early part of a century, it's a pretty well-known case, for some reason I can't think of the name now, where a Catholic priest refused to have the vaccine. They told him that if he didn't, he couldn't have mass because he could potentially infect other people. The case, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that he needed to have it or stop you know, conducting religious activity. Uh, I, I would just, I would piggyback on, on Professor Moreno quickly and just point out that we have, just like anything else, you stop at a stoplight at a corner, at a red light, not because we just randomly want you to do that. It's done because we need, as an ordered society, to protect each other. When polio came out in the early 1900s and a vaccine was developed, it wasn't more than a couple of years. I mean, less than a year, everybody was vaccinated. Polio is dead, is dead in this in the world. So this is, you know, that it's a balancing act. We in this country have a duty to each other. And that's I'll leave it at that. Yeah, something to highlight is that I guess in our generation, we never saw this happening. You know, when this the Spanish flu, right, for instance, we some of us weren't even alive who've read that. So it's also something new to us. And so that's why it's, it's difficult too. Thank you for the answers. We have the last question. What would Jefferson and Madison's opinions be on federal government today? Hmm. Professor Moreno, you got your first two minutes. Uh, I think that, uh, Jefferson would, uh, of course, be uh, vehemently opposed to the attitudes of the federal government um, on certain issues. Uh, he will be on board with the federal government on other issues. For example, on the vaccine issue, uh, there was an issue that came up in Jefferson's time uh, reg regarding uh, vaccine. He was, he was all for it. So I think he would support, uh, let's say, the Biden uh, administration uh, policy on vaccine. I think he would have been deadly opposed to the previous administration on a whole host of issue. Uh, but I'm afraid if I get deeper into that, we'll delve into partisan politics, so I'll stay away from it. Uh, I, I would say that uh, that's, I'm going to leave that to historians, but, and this is something that I want to point out, is that Jefferson was not monolithic, meaning that Jefferson in 1787 or 1776 was vastly different than Jefferson in 1790. Post-French Revolution, Thomas Jefferson changed his idea that people were wonderful people. When he went to France and found people chopping, uh, chopping nobles' heads off in, during the French Revolution, after our revolution, he was aghast at what was going on. So I would say that you need to, that question needs to be asked in the context of what would 1785 Jefferson think? And what would 1795 Jefferson think? Because I think you're going to get different answers. And I'll leave it at that. Are there any more questions, Dennis? No, this is this is all for today. Okay. Um, well, I want to close. I, I want to first thank both professors for this uh, uh, outstanding intellectual 
um, discussion. And I want to say to the students that are watching, I think the big message here is that whether you take the Jeffersonian uh, or the Adams view, um, that it's important that we have this document that we abide by. And you know what? We might disagree with both views or some of the views presented by both sides. But what's important here is something that, you know, Professor Rivers highlighted. And it was that we live in a society of law and order, right? And um, it, it's good to have it. But, you know, what I would take away from this is that every society defines what the Constitution is like. Someone just asked a question about, you know, what would, what would Jefferson think today? Does that really matter? Maybe in a historical context, yes, but today we're defining what, and, and, and I'm sure that both Professor Rivers and Moreno would agree with this, that the Constitution is constantly tested and we've seen it with Black Lives Matters and other movements, right? And so for those students that are wondering, should they get involved, right? Um, I am a proponent and I support civil disobedience without getting in trouble, right? Let's speak the lay, lay person's um, language here, especially you uh, students that are out there um, who are trying to get into this field, you need to keep a clean record, right? And so for that reason, yes, you can protest. Yes, you can get involved, but always following the law. And that that's how I see it. And, and, and continue studying. And um, like I said, this is fruit for thought. It doesn't matter where you are, but you heard it from these two professors. Um, there's a lot to learn. This was a taste of what it is. So happy Constitution Day. And I hope that this uh, begins a whole um, intellectual discussion amongst the students and that you dig in more to learn about the different articles of the Constitution. Thank you, Dennis, for putting this together. And we look forward to the next conference. Thank you so much, professors. You did an outstanding job. Thank you. Thanks Thank you, you for coming. Thank you, everybody. Well, Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.